Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's great. It's great to see you all this morning. Beautiful weather, and and uh, so let me start with the beginning here by asking a question. What do I mean when I say a job is hazardous? Dangerous. Dangerous. That's right. Okay. You're with me on this. I mean, and it's possible the job could end in death, right? If you're not careful. We wouldn't think in this country being a gospel messenger is dangerous. But listen to this account in the early career of Paul. This is quite amazing. While they were at Lystra, they came upon a man with crippled feet who had been that way from birth. So he had never walked. He was listening as Paul preached, and Paul noticed him and realized he had faith to be healed. So Paul called to him, stand up. And the man leaped to his feet and started walking. When the listening crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in their local dialect, of course, these men are gods in human bodies. They decided that Barnabas was the Greek god Jupiter and that Paul, because he was the chief speaker, was Mercury. The local priest of the temple of Jupiter, located on the outskirts of the city, brought them carloads of flowers and prepared to sacrifice oxen to them at the city gates before the crowds. But when Barnabas and Saul saw what was happening, they ripped at their clothing in dismay and ran out among the people, shouting, Men, what are you doing? We are merely human beings like yourselves. We have come to bring you the good news that you are invited to turn from the worship of these foolish yeah. things and to pray instead to the living God who made heaven and earth and sea and everything in them. In bygone days, he permitted the nations to go their own ways, but he never left himself without a witness. There were always his reminders, the kind things he did, such as sending you rain and good crops and giving you food and gladness. But even so, Paul and Barnabas could scarcely restrain the people from sacrificing to them. Yet only a few days later, some Jews arrived from Antioch and Iconium and turned the crowds into a murderous mob that stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, apparently dead. But as the believers stood around him, he got up and went back into the city. And the next day, he left with Barnabas for Derby. And I'm just puzzled in saying, how did he get up and go on with his work? I think it had to be God's grace and God's strength made possible, don't you? I think that was it. And he went on about his work as if nothing had happened. <laughs> what an amazing ministry. Doug, I didn't ask you ahead of time, but would you lead us in prayer to begin? And as you pray, there's some people that are sick, that are not here, that are sick. You can probably guess who some of them are. <laughs> but uh, pray for folks that are sick, all right? Dearly Father, come to you today to praise the Lord for what? For the ability to be here. We ask God to use the families that are sick today with different various causes or illnesses, Lord, we need to follow you.
good. All right, let's see what we've got. If you got your prayer list and you turn it over, we got a birthday today. Who said that? Somebody was excited to say it. All right. Charlie, your name's already been shouted out from this side. <laughs> Happy birthday, Charlie. And uh, you know what? I know how old Charlie is without him saying it. Travis, he's 91. Oh, man. Am I right? 91? You're right. You're 91 right. years of young age. That's 11 and 9 in there somewhere. Huh? There's a one and nine there somewhere. <laughs> no, 19, right? <laughs> All right, let's give a round of applause. Happy birthday. <laughs> okay, and then your beloved wife has a birthday this week, Gary. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a good birthday, too. <laughs> yeah. Now, you know I'm thinking she's born in the same year I am. Is it 64? I knew there was something I liked about Tammy. Yeah. Year 64, we're both in that same year and both born in the same month. Yeah. And we're, we are your two favorite people. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I'd get a smile out of you. <laughs> All right, so let your dearly beloved wife let her know we wish her a happy birthday today, okay? And then we have an anniversary. And they're hiding in the back. Bill and Carol, they're waving through the window. They're in the back there, they have an anniversary. And you know, their anniversary is just about as old as I am. Don't wow. do the math. <laughs> so, happy anniversary, Bill and Carol. Give me a round of applause. Okay, then next, if you look there, Erica Simone, she is still serving at the mission in Indiana where her and her husband went many years ago, and she's traveling to be with us next Sunday. And I forgot to tell the Sunday school class that she'll be in our class next Sunday, so we will just be interacting with her as we do with our missionaries, and then she'll also be sharing something in the service, okay? And if you... Think about it, set something aside to give next week for her expenses in travel coming from Indiana. And she's gonna be, I think, in our area at least a month, a month, okay? So, so let's, you know, remember Erica and look forward to seeing her next Sunday. And then uh, the next announcement is the Israel story, which we announced last week is beginning tonight. Um, if you come, I really would like to know so I can give you handouts. I have exactly the number that have signed up last week. But if you want to come tonight, just get your name down there, and I'll be sure and have handouts for you also. And again, I am so excited to show this because of what can be gained and learned. I am just thrilled to do it. So it's going to be very good. And it's going to be in the nature format of how I led Sunday school classes for years and Wednesday Bible study for years. It's, it's an interactive type. So please, if you haven't thought about coming, think about it. Get your name down if you're going to come, and I'll have handouts for you. Okay, daily breads. Last week I made the announcement about the old ones, and I'm thankful four of them disappeared. So there's only two left. Thank you, those that took four and got rid of them so there's two more to get rid of again take it give it to a family uh, a neighbor a friend a co-worker uh, so that we don't have to throw those in the trash okay prayer requests uh, i have three of them um, if you look on your prayer list i can point them out to you starting with number three roger logston as you can see right there, has a medical test on his back this Tuesday, and then they will do possible treatment after the testing. The testing is to determine the best place to do the treatment and then do the treatment. So let's pray that that goes well and it happens. And then if you look at the very bottom of the list, there's somebody that Dwayne Caton knows very well at the bottom, Nathan, his son. And so Nathan is having a procedure on his heart done tomorrow, right? Tomorrow. 
and it's a hole in his heart that was discovered later, and so they're going to do the procedure to um, repair it. So that would be tomorrow. And then one more, uh, if you look at number 20, Judy King. Um, I got together with her yesterday because she wanted to fill me in on some things that she would ask that you would pray for, and so she gave me a good inclination of what she's up to. Anyways, she's traveling tonight, leaving to go to Scotland to hook up with her associate from when they did ministry together, and she's been in contact with the tribes people that her and her colleagues served in the Amazon for about 40 years. And what she's learned from them is that they're lacking in the materials that her and her colleague uh, produced. Fortunately, her and her colleague have all the manuscripts that they created for the materials. So when she's in Scotland, they're going to try and start producing materials that they need. Um, the songbooks or hymnals that they had produced and scriptures. Okay, they're going to produce some while they're together, okay? So she would covet your prayers for that effort, to get those materials produced, and then to finally get them to the tribes people in the Amazon, where her and her colleagues serve, okay? So I think that's all my announcements, but I do have one announcement I'm not gonna overlook. Uh, Linda Nicastro, wave your hand back there, Linda. She's gonna be a grandma. Oh. Isn't that exciting? Oh. I told her Darren is a good name. <laughs> right? Why are you laughing? It's a good name. I said, that's a good name. Be sure and let them know. If you spell it right, it's even better. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for your blessings on us as brothers and sisters in Christ. It's so good that we can share in joys and also share in concerns. We are thankful and grateful for those that are celebrating uh, birthdays and anniversaries. We think of Charlie here in our midst. We also think of Tammy. And we're so glad for both of them celebrating this week another birthday. We ask your blessings on them. And then we think of Bill and Carol celebrating another year of their marriage. And we're so thankful for their presence here. We ask your blessing on them as they celebrate that special occasion. We also rejoice over the news of a, a child to be born uh, in Linda and Castro's family. And so we pray that you will be with the young couple as they prepare for that uh, birth, and we pray your blessing would be on them through this time. And then, Father, we think of the requests that we have that we're thinking about. Roger coming up on Tuesday with uh, testing on his back and a possible procedure, we would pray that everything would go smoothly, that he would benefit greatly. We also think of Nathan Caton as he has the procedure tomorrow to fix the hole in his heart, and we would pray that everything would go well, there would be no complications, that he would get through it safely. And then we also, Lord, think of Judy King as she travels back to Scotland to meet with her colleague to begin to put together the materials that those tribes people are greatly in need of. We would ask that you would bless that effort and they be, be able to produce as many materials as they desire and that they could get those into the hands of the tribes people who long for those things. Thank you for what you're going to accomplish. Thank you for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name. Okay, for our greeting hymn, we're going to go to number 531. And then you probably need a little bit of explanation about what's going on and what you see on number 531. If you notice, there's, uh, am I getting this right, Karen, two stanzas or two lines? Two lines that are doing the same thing, okay? And basically what that is is, this is from my youth, this song. I sang as a teenager in the youth group I was in. Um, there's a part that gets repeated. That's why you've got two lines that say the same thing, but a little bit uh, moved aside there, so there's a repeat, okay? I'm gonna be singing the second line all the way through, so if you wanna do the repeat at the top, you're welcome to do it. But we'll sing through the song once, and then we'll greet one another. 
Yeah. So, how many know this song before you stand up? Oh, boy. <laughs> okay. Just stay seated, play the tune, Beth. Yeah. I'm playing the lower notes. Just... I don't, you know, there will be notes. I'll just sing how I remember it. <laughs> All right. <laughs>
time of year with this year. So.
for me, my introduction into letter writing, this is before computer days, when I was a child, was when my grandparents moved far away. They moved to Arizona for health reasons for my grandmother. My grandmother and my mother were very good letter writers. And so they corresponded by letter. It seemed like weekly, but probably monthly. And probably one of the prized possessions was anytime I saw a letter from grandma show up at the house. Even though it was addressed to mom, it was for everybody. And I would read that thing probably about three or four times because of the sorrow I felt about being 2,000 miles away from grandma and grandpa. Well, I had never much written letters until I met my wife. And we worked at camp together. And when the camp season was over, which is the month of August, our camp ran into the month of August, probably about two weeks. And then after camp was over, we dated. And we were just starting to get to know one another when she moved away to teach in a school in another state. So I began writing letters to her, and she began writing letters to me, and eventually it led to an engagement. And so letter writing. Okay, this is before computers, pen and paper. Okay, you remember those days. Well, Paul is writing a letter to the followers of Christ in Thessalonica. You see, he had been with them right around a month, and then he was forced to leave, not of his own accord. And he had worked with his teammates there. And after hearing about their condition, after the weeks apart had grown, he began to write them. And the motivation to write is that these are brand new believers that he was privileged to see born into existence. They are his spiritual children. So this letter is one of the first of his many letters. And it's during that second missionary adventure. And here's another question to consider. What do you say or what do you write to a new group of believers only saved and baptized for a short time? It, there's a lot of things you could think about to write. Well, there are three things that Paul points to in the beginning of his letter that I'd like to highlight. Okay? Something to be given. Something to be reminded. And something to be maintained. So let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. We're not going to go very far in this chapter, just probably a few verses. That's all. Okay, so 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And we want to start right at the very beginning, at the top of verse 1. And there's three names that are listed at the beginning. That's what I want to focus on, three names. Notice what the three names are. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. That's the introduction. I kind of like that, you know? It speaks of a humble and deeply caring type of introduction. I would think of it as filled with love. It's interesting to see that Paul didn't say apostle. He didn't say pastor. He didn't say minister or even boss. Paul, Silvanus, Timothy. It reminds me of the words of Jesus. And maybe you'll remember the words of Jesus this way. I am giving a new commandment to you now. Love each other just as much as I have loved you. New believers need a humble and caring type of love without any pride involved. For example... Let's talk about babies. Linda, you've got one coming on the way. 
okay, in your family. So let's talk about newborns, okay? A newborn baby. What does a newborn baby need from us? Everything. Huh? Everything. Everything. And you know what everything comes from? Love, right? You give a little baby a lot of love. You hold it, you hug it, you kiss on it. You do all those things that you do for a newborn, right? A lot of loving things. And the same thing goes for the young in the Lord. They need love. And you might say, well, why is that? New believers often stumble. First of all, I've noticed that new believers often stumble in trying to express what they're experiencing in Christ for the first time. They kind of trip over their tongue all the time. And too many times I've noticed we want to correct every incorrectly expressed idea and say, that's not how you're supposed to say it. It's supposed to be this way. But what should we do with folks like that? I think we should help them to say what they mean through love and understanding rather than berating them for saying it wrong. I've kind of learned by experience. I remember as a youth in a setting where I was excited for the first time in my life about Christ and about participating in Christian activity. And I can remember standing up in front of a group of my peers in an auditorium like this, if you can imagine, filled with 11th graders, a hundred of them. And I stood up for the first time as an 11th grader to announce to them the Bible study that I was attending and how it was, how fun it was. And not only did we do the Bible study, but we did some fun activities. And I had never stood up in front of a group ever in my life as a teenager. So you can imagine how that went. And I was followed by an, an experienced youth worker that pretty much got up and berated me publicly in front of the same group after I stepped down because I got it wrong or I said it wrong. I never forgot that, you know, but it didn't spoil my enthusiasm for Jesus, even in spite of that. But I often think about that when I'm talking with the young and the Lord and they're expressing to me their ideas about what they're experiencing and I'll, I'll often just simply say, you mean to say this? And they'll usually have a big smile broadly and they'll go, yes, that's what I need. And then I'll say, you know, that's so good. I'm glad you shared that truth with me about your life. What a difference. Love and understanding can make in the lives of new believers. Now, does this mean we never give them guidance and we never give them instruction? No. But we should often remember what Jesus did with his group of disciples when they got it wrong. For example, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? You know they're going in the wrong direction. In that moment, this is what Jesus did. He called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become as your little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now, you know what I would say? I think that was a very good way to instruct them in the truth that accomplished much without humiliating them in a severe tone. You see, something to be given to the young is love and understanding. Well, the next thought is, well, something to be, we would say, remember. Something to not be forgotten. So again, let's go back to verse 1 where we left off and look at the remainder of the verse. <coughs> to the church of the Thessalonians and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
it's very important for the young in the Lord to know the roots, the roots of their faith and of their newly formed family relationship in the Lord. What we understand is this is not a man-created fellowship, right? This is not a political rally, right? This is not a sports event. This is not a pop music concert. It's something more. The roots of this assembly are firmly gripped in the grace poured out through God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul, he gives a great explanation in another letter that he writes in this way. He says, God is so rich in mercy. He loved us so much that even though we were spiritually dead and doomed by our sins, he gave us back our lives again when he raised Christ from the dead. Only by his undeserved favor have we ever been saved and lifted us up from the grave into glory along with Christ where we sit with him in the heavenly realms all because of what Christ Jesus did. And now, God can always point to us as examples. Examples of how very, very rich His kindness is, as shown in all He has done for us through Jesus Christ. Because of His kindness, you've been saved through trusting Christ. And even trusting is not of yourselves. It, too, is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good we have done. So none of us can take any credit for it. Now, by contrast, cults and false religions, you know what they do to the grace of God? They trample it underfoot. For what? For their own works of righteousness. To gain a platform. To say, look at me. Look at what I can do. Where boasting exists, then you can be sure that God's grace has been nullified. It is only after the grace of God is poured out on us that we gain a meaningful and lasting peace with God. And it's expressed in this way. So now, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith in his promises, we can have real peace with him because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. For because of our faith, he has brought us into the place of highest privilege where we now stand. And we can confidently and joyfully look forward to actually becoming all that God has had in mind for us. I'd say it's a great peace of mind and heart to know we are right with God. Would you agree with that today? It's a great peace of mind to know I'm right with God. Now we can look forward to what he has in mind for us in this life. Just as this comforting thought written by Paul. Are you ready? There is now no condemnation awaiting those who belong to Christ Jesus. Do you understand what that means? It means we will never be condemned by him as his children. You mean, no matter what, yes, you will never be condemned. Huh. The greatest temptation to any believer in this life is to abandon the beauty of God's grace and peace. For the self-styled works of a cult or a false religion, like what Paul encountered from his first missionary journey 
Now you can imagine how near and dear the people from his first missionary journey were always in his heart and his mind. And he writes, Oh foolish Galatians! What magician has hypnotized you and cast an evil spell upon you? For you used to see the meaning of Jesus Christ's death as clearly as though I had waved a placard before you with a picture on it of Christ dying on the cross. Let me ask you one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by trying to keep the Jewish laws? Of course not. For the Holy Spirit came upon you only after you heard about Christ and trusted him to save you. Then have you gone completely crazy? For if trying to obey the Jewish laws never gave you spiritual life in the first place, why do you think that trying to obey them now will make you stronger Christians? You have suffered much for the gospel. Now are you going to just throw it all overboard? I can hardly believe it. I ask you again, does God give you the power of the Holy Spirit and work miracles among you as a result of you trying to obey the Jewish laws? No, of course not. <coughs> it is when you believe in Christ and fully trust him. Abraham had the same experience. God declared him fit for heaven only because he believed God's promises. You can see from this that the real children of Abraham are all the men of faith who truly trust in God. What's more, the scriptures looked forward to this time when God would save the Gentiles also through their faith. You know, we all have something in common with Gentiles. This is speaking directly to us. God told Abraham about this long ago when he said, I will bless those in every nation who trust in me as you do. And so it is. All who trust in Christ share the same blessing Abraham received. You see, these believers in Galatia that he's writing to had yielded to the temptation involving false teachers with Jewish backgrounds. The simplicity of faith, grace, peace in God is hated. It is hated by all those who know not God especially the leaders of cults and false religions. The final part, the last part, is something to be maintained. Let's look at this. Verses 2 through 4. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of our God and Father, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. Paul and his team are grateful for the new birth in each believer. And they're praying for this young group to maintain what I would describe as spiritual health. What does spiritual health look like? Well, Paul wrote to those at Corinth, now abides faith, hope, love, these three. Spiritual health is dependent on all three being present in a believer. And we're learning right now from him that all three did exist in this young group of believers. So let's look at these three a little carefully, okay? Your work of faith. Your work of faith is the beginning and the continuing of eternal life. The initial work of faith in any follower of Christ is to what? Believe upon Christ by turning away from whatever 
stands in his place to begin with. According to Paul here, it was idols that stood in the way. That they turned from to embrace Jesus by faith. But that work of faith has only just begun according to James. What he writes in the New Testament. Here's what James writes. Remember, it is a message to obey. Not just listen to. So don't fool yourselves. For if a person just listens, doesn't obey, he is like a man looking at his face in a mirror. As soon as he walks away, he can't see himself anymore or remember what he looks like. But if anyone keeps looking steadily into God's law for free men, he will not only remember it, but he will do what it says, and God will greatly bless him in everything he does. Oh. So you see, we start by faith, but you see, we continue by faith. It's a process that we go through our whole life. And this faith that's being talked about is not a passive faith, a sit, for example, on your duff faith. Everybody get that? That's common. That's my name, Duff. That's the seat. That's sitting on your duff, but continuing to be active in my faith. Let's look at the second part of the help, and that is your labor of love. Your labor of love gets at the heart or motivation for doing anything in the faith. John the Apostle explains it quite well in this way. Listen. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, that he is God's son and your savior, then you are a child of God. And all who love the father love his children too. So you can find out how much you love God's children, your brothers and sisters in the Lord, by how much you love and obey God. Loving God means doing what he tells us to do. And really, that isn't hard at all. And I got to ask myself, well, why isn't it hard at all? We do what we do out of a heart of love, not duty. And that makes all the difference. Why do we continue to show love inside of God's family? It is out of love not duty. When we begin looking at obeying God as a burden, then you know something? Love has slipped. When we consider loving other believers as a heavy burden, then love for God has really slipped. When we can disobey God easily and continually, then you know something? We don't love God as we profess to do. If we can abandon God's family and not even care, then we don't love God as we profess to be. But you see, these folks that are being written to, they definitely love obeying God, and they definitely love demonstrating love for one another. You would go, what a wonderful example for young believers to show. And then the third part, your patience of hope, is the ability to keep persevering in the midst of difficult circumstances and, might I add, among difficult people. How many of you have rubbed shoulders with difficult people in your life? Don't raise your hand. But I saw a lot of heads go up and look at me. Am I the difficult person? Why do believers in Jesus keep persevering like this in difficult circumstances and among difficult people? Why is it? Here's a simple answer. Our hope is not in circumstances. So it can be sunny or it can be cloudy 
without a lasting effect on us. Our hope is not in people. So they can be very mean or they can be kind without changing our ability to persevere. You see, the patience of our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ and his coming back for us just as he said. And you might say, and what did he say? He said to us, let not your heart be troubled. You are trusting in God, now trust in me. There are many homes up there where my father lives and I am going to prepare them for your coming. When everything is ready, then I will come and get you so that you can always be with me where I am. If this weren't so, I would tell you plainly. In the present time, everything will not be right around us. Do you know that? And in the present time, everyone will not be right that is around us. But in spite of those two things, it has no bearing on our ability to persevere. You see, our eyes are fixed on Jesus, not the circumstances and not the people. This group of believers, folks, lived in a hotbed of bad circumstances and very, very hostile people. These hostile people were not about to change their opinions overnight. Their circumstances were not about to change overnight either. And in spite of it all, they clung to their hope in Christ, as all of us should. Now let me ask you, how often do we put our hope on circumstances changing or even people changing? How often do we put all our eggs in that basket that something's going to change? And then when things don't change, we are more disappointed than ever before. Isn't that so? But listen to this answer. What is faith? It is the confident assurance that something we want is going to happen. It is the certainty that what we hope for is waiting for us, even though we cannot see it up ahead. Now let me tell you, the only assurance and the only certainty in this life is Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. It is only Jesus Christ. And everything else is sinking sand. So keep your feet planted firmly on the solid rock, meaning Jesus Christ. Now, what do the presence of these three traits prove besides spiritual health? They define who the chosen of God are. You see, if anyone belongs to God or is a chosen follower of God, then it must be a believer who gives evidence of these three things. And this is exactly what Paul states to them. Look at verse 4. He says, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. It's so obvious who you belong to. It's so obvious beyond a shadow of a doubt. You are the chosen. That should put a big smile on our face, right? If these things are in me, oh, man. And if you're lacking in these things, it would do well to go back and check your birth. 
to check your birth. Because it's a terrible thing to be deceived. And James says it's even a more terrible thing to be self-deceived. Check your birth. How would we sum this all up? Maybe by asking a couple of questions. Many of you here are older in Jesus Christ, older than me in Jesus Christ. So the question that the older ones probably need to think about, and that is, are you giving love to the younger that are in Christ? And not your harsh criticism. Because they need our love. They need our understanding. They need our guidance. And now let's flip the coin and let's go to the young. The young in the Lord. Let's ask you a question. What's the question? Have you kept track of your roots in Christ? Are you keeping track of your roots? You know, it's God's grace that makes you a part of His family. It's God's peace that keeps our heart and our hearts and our minds free from everything that Satan wants to do in criticizing and condemning us. And then for all of us, how is our spiritual health? This how is it? Are we healthy? Like what we just looked at, what Paul wrote there. Work of faith. Labor of love. Perseverance. If you'd say, boy, I don't think I'm really healthy this morning. Good news. You're in the right place to get up. And the Father's ready to do whatever is needed to help you be healthy. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we come before you right now, we think about what we've been able to read of this wonderful letter just the very beginning of it. We've just scratched the surface. And there are some very rich truths there for all of us to glean and to apply in our hearts, in our souls, in our minds. Sometimes we might look with a little disdain on the simple the simple things to think about and be reminded of. But yet I really realize that sometimes it's the simple things that we need to think about the most. As I think about my own life in Christ, I would just continue to throw myself at your mercy asking for help. Because the more I have grown to know you the more I realize how much I need help. Daily help to walk with you and to live the kind of life that reflects me being chosen by you. That it would be undeniable. And I would pray for each and every one here that you would also give them the help that they need. Whatever it might be to shore them up Strengthen them spiritually in their health to help them to continue to be what you've called them to be. Thank you for your grace, your mercy, the righteousness, the love, all the things that we've experienced from you. Thank you, Father. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. One last hymn I'd like to sing is number 526. Number 526. We're going to sing verses 1, 3, and 4. Okay, 1, 3, and 4. So when you find your place, join me in singing. Thank you. 